There's a business case behind well-being, connection, and change. And that is that happy, well-rounded, engaged employees are creative and productive employees. Place design has an impact on human behavior, regardless of whether that impact is intentional. It can either help or be a hindrance to our objectives. And I think we can build that much more engaging environment that just feels better. We don't have to wait. Place design practitioners can create an environment for almost any purpose. But if an organization has not articulated what that purpose is or what the outcomes they hope to achieve, you're wasting a lot of time and resources in creating buildings without a specific intent. I would dare say that most workplaces are misaligned with what people need right now. The traditional values of the workplace have all been centered around efficiency, quality assurance, that manifested in large open office spaces with just row after row of uniform desks that were all the same. Expecting all activity to play out in a uniform environment just doesn't make sense. We should be focusing on asking the right questions. The first question, what are the outcomes that we seek to achieve as an organization and are we aligned across the organization? By the way, return to office is not a good answer to that question. It should be something like, we have a new strategy we want to implement, or we've got to double down and make sure that we're implementing at scale and flawlessly. These are the types of answers that we should focus on. Return to office is fine, but to do what? That's the critical missing piece of a lot of the dialogue now. What current working processes and support can help our teams achieve those objectives and what could be better for the second question? And then the third, how can we use our physical environment to experiment with new ways of working to deliver better outcomes? I would begin every workplace project with those considerations before thinking any about what the shape of the physical environment should be. Well-being is ultimately very personal. It's the subjective assessment that a person has on the, the quality of their life, and it's influenced by physical, psychological, and social experiences. You can look at how color and pattern are introduced into an environment. Different people have different reactions to those things. One of my dear colleagues, a proud Latina woman, shared this anecdote with me how color and vibrant pattern are a really important part of her existence but many of the workplaces that she's experienced are very subdued. So she felt herself going through a noticeable shift to conform herself to that environment rather than something that was more native. So if you have um, places, variety throughout a workplace, moments for that vibrant expression, moments for calm, uh, so that different folks can kind of seek out spaces that feel more natural to them, that's really important. Or it could be something as simple as providing a quiet and private place to deal with things outside of the prying eyes of others. That could be taking an insulin shot, that could be um, decompressing from a particularly heated call uh, with a colleague or an external collaborator, but just finding spaces to be able to step away and decompress can be really helpful to uh, maintain focus on, on what's really important in work. Connections are essentially relationships relationships between people, places, ideas, and things. And those connections can happen in person, virtually as extended through digital technology, or in an abstract manner through the ideas, values, thoughts, and beliefs that we hold in our hearts and minds. The workplace provides an opportunity for us to connect with people that we wouldn't normally be exposed to in our day-to-day -day lives outside of work. When we talk about those physical in-person connections, creating environments where it's easy for people to meet face to face um, and really feel natural and relaxed in a relaxed posture. If your only option for social connection is a formal meeting room, that's going to have kind of a, a stilting kind of an impact on the social connection that you have with that person versus something that's more relaxed like what I'm sitting in now. On the more virtual side, creating environments that make it easy to use digital technology to connect with someone who's in a different physical place and making sure that that's not a stressful experience is really important. Change is a natural and necessary part of life. What we need to be able to assess where we're changing from, um, so be able to measure the impact. And so this is where we start to get into this notion of outcomes that we hope to, to seek. 
If we don't have a starting benchmark to assess, then how are we going to know that we've met a goal that we've wanted to stretch towards? Triggers for change can come from anywhere. Sometimes they come from within an organization, other times they're external factors. In the most ideal sense, I would hope that they're coming from someone having an insight about uh, an idea on how things could be done differently to achieve better results. But there are also more negative external factors. So this really emphasizes how important it is for organizations to be able to pivot at a moment's notice. And so this is a completely different way of thinking about creating and maintaining and evolving a workplace over time that really underscores those themes of well-being, not only at the individual level, but also at the collective level, connection between us and the organization and our objectives, and the constant state of change that we really need to become comfortable with to be successful in, our, in this modern life. We need to acknowledge that people are simultaneously showing up as individuals, members of teams, and representatives of broader communities. And that means that we'll prioritize different types of environments depending on which role we're filling at any given moment. If I'm focused on that individual dynamic, I may be seeking out spaces that are for productive focus to get things done, or spaces for respite, reflection, to disconnect and recharge. So you'll probably want to have some environments that are smaller, more dimly lit, more um, soothing in their treatment of color, texture, and pattern. But you'll also want to have individual environments that are on the other end of the spectrum that help people recharge, re-energize, and prepare for a group level interaction. So on one hand, we need a lot of consistency in an environment to shield out distraction and keep focus for that flawless implementation. On the other hand, we need an environment that can very fluidly be reconfigured. If I'm representing broader, that broader community aspect within the workplace, I'm gonna prioritize even different environments. A great community space has um, a significant variety of different types of places to um, sit, arranged in different um, configurations, you know, some face-to-face, -face, some side-by-side, -side, soft seats, firm seats, some with arms, without arms, um, some that are right in the center of attention, some that are more on the fringe. It's probably a good idea to introduce some harder surfaces, maybe with some glossy finishes, and think about how light interacts with those surfaces. It literally bounces off of them around the room. Your eye is going to do the same thing. If you're wanting to encourage connection with other people, you want the eye to travel, to move around, see what's out there, connect with other things. Sometimes you need to bring representatives from different teams together for a very specific and targeted purpose. And so those environments are configured differently as well. These are more akin to um, a conventional kind of training room type setup where there's more of a speaker and audience setup. So it's still a community dynamic, but it's very different than encouraging people to connect socially. This type of space uh, can really serve lots of different purposes. So it gives us this ability to cycle between different modes of engagement in a very intuitive and natural way. At Miller Knoll, we've addressed this by really digging deep into our knowledge of place design. We start with deep research, research into human behavior and its relationship with the built environment. We use that research to inform the things that we make, the things that people need in order to be successful. We are gonna ask questions like, what is your purpose as an organization? How do you deliver on your outcomes? We're gonna ask questions about your individual people. How are they showing up in your place? What is their experience like outside of your office? That's critically important to understand if you're gonna provide effective support within your proper workplace. Whatever the answer to those questions are, the environment can be configured to support that broad range of needs. This is all about increasing the awareness of the impact of the physical place on our behavior and on our expectations and treating the place as a tool that we use for work as opposed to a container for work. The net result is a, a place that has a lot of variety, intentional variety, that is uh, combined together in a very specific way. You can make positive impact through almost any intervention in the physical environment. 
The workplace of the future will not be a singular place. It'll be a living, organic network of environments that actively responds to the world around us. It'll be more inclusive, more vibrant, and more differentiated than what we're used to seeing. That is a completely different world than that sea of workstations, row after row after row of similar desks and environments that are much more engaging, stimulating, that I can see a reflection of myself and a reflection of my coworkers, learn about their experiences, try new things. It's just a much more engaging environment that just feels better. And I think we can build that. We don't have to wait.